It took over 20 years for the first million EVs to be sold around the world. The next million took about 18 months, and it's predicted by Bloomberg New Energy Finance that the third million will take only about eight months, and that we'll sell about 1.6 million cars around the world this year with plugs on them. And this excites me greatly, <laughs> because for uh, over half my life, I have worked on each of those millions, going back to the General Motors EV1 program in the mid-1990s. And it was a very heady time. It was very much like people described this moment right now. We were one of several automakers building EVs, and even though the numbers were starting small, it looked like this was just inevitable. And I loved every minute of it. From the moment I first drove that car and fell in love with the technology and the torque and all of the potential that it had. I had found my dream job at 20 years old, and while I expected to only work on that program till I graduated from university and then go off and do something else, what started as a college job became sort of my life's work. I also met my husband along the way working on that program, and so my son, who's now 19, owes his life to electric cars and is probably the oldest child <laughs> to not ever know a time that they, that they didn't exist in his life. So it's very fair to say that the technology plays a fairly significant role for me in all fronts. But reality also set in along the way, in that we learned that automakers were not as invested, not as interested as we had hoped early on, and that they were mostly making them because of law in California, it made them do it. I mean, they were, they were required to build EVs as a condition of continuing to sell cars at all. But the reality is they made more money on trucks and SUVs and conventional vehicles, and so when they had the opportunity, they sued the state of California, mostly rolled back the, the regulation, took the cars back, and crushed them. Oh. <laughs> That's oh. my reaction. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, it was, it was very unfortunate, and we did all sorts of things, some goofy, some not, to try to prevent it. We held 24-hour vigils, we held a funeral for the car to try to draw some press attention, all sorts of things. And at the time, in every presentation, whenever I talked to somebody, I would encourage them not to boycott car companies, but to contact the, your favorite one or, or several and ask for what you want to build, because that's what we always hear. We want to build what people want to buy. And especially at the time, because Bob Lutz, who was the vice chairman of General Motors, was so antagonistic about EVs, and I thought, he just doesn't get it. He needs to hear from some real people. I may have included his direct email address in a number of those presentations. Bob.lutz at gm.com. I don't think it works anymore. <laughs> But we also wanted to at least make sure the story got told. We figured even if you think we're the crazy ones, where's some frontline documentary, PBS, public television types, whoever, to tell this story? And those that did mostly told it as EV drivers bid fond farewell to their electric cars and get ready for hydrogen. And several of the drivers and a bunch of us got together and went, oh my god, this is so not the story. And so a couple of guys decided to do what you do when you're from Los Angeles and you're frustrated and no one will tell your story, and we made a movie. It took about five years. We thought we'd burn copies for our parents and move on for, with our lives. <laughs> and instead, Sony Pictures bought the film, put it first into Sundance and then into theaters across the country and in some cases around the world, where the film didn't go uh, commercially, a bunch of volunteers in, in a variety of places contacted us and said, if I translate this film voluntarily, can I show it? We said, yes, absolutely, we don't mind at all. <laughs> Go forth and pirate. And so they did. And it made a lot of people angry, a reaction we were okay with. But it got a lot of people talking, and a lot of people interested, and a lot of people continuing to ask for EVs. And about six months after that first film came out, General Motors unveiled the Chevy Volt at the Detroit um, auto show in 2007. And we went along to watch, because we were very curious and, and trying to figure out if they were serious. And at the after party, Bob Lutz came to me and he said, can you get your people to stop writing me now? <laughs> and his daughter overheard us, and, and, and she pulled me aside and she said, don't you dare, because you have no idea how those people changed my father's mind. And so the unveiling of, of that auto show ended up also becoming the first shoot in our second film, <laughs> which we didn't intend to make, called Revenge of the Electric Car, because our first one was a murder mystery, and after you do that, you gotta do a monster movie. And so Revenge uh, basically tells the story of three car companies, Tesla, General Motors, and Nissan, trying to bring EVs back. And it's very different than our first one. It's, it's dramatic in different ways, but it's also a little bit of a valentine to, to the guys involved. 
But as much as, as making movies has been fun, <laughs> it's also moonlighting for me. So what I do day in and day out normally, my real job, is actually working with car companies and utilities and governments and advocates around the world to try to put more EVs on the road. And so to share some observations that I've made, which are almost without question fairly universal, there are a bunch of related technologies right now that can be very helpful to electrification. Autonomous vehicles, connected vehicles, shared vehicles, all sorts of buzzwords and different things happening, different degrees of reality, but the, f the fact remains that people are very excited about the potential of all of these. And so while those technologies are not codependent with electric transportation, they're certainly co-enabling. At the same time, one of my concerns it has been that in that in the hype of that overall conversation, electrification almost is treated as a foregone conclusion. Eh, it's just a rolling snowball that can't be stopped. We can all move on to other things, and we're not quite to that point. Because the automotive industry itself is still collectively ambivalent about doing electric transportation. They still would prefer not to mostly, if given the chance. And there's varying degrees which range from some car companies being all in to some that say, please don't buy my EV, and everything in the middle. But as a body, they're not entirely in it yet. And that's unfortunate, but it also puts more responsibility on us. Because it's a little bit like asking someone to look at a Walkman 30 years ago and imagine an iPhone. What we hear from car companies is, when we see demand for electric cars, then we'll start to build them. The problem with that is the number one thing I hear running around <laughs> is I didn't know electric cars were possible. So what we're trying to do here is get someone to look at that Walkman 30 years ago and go, I wish this were the size of a deck of cards and I could watch TV on it and order pizza and get a car to come pick me up and maybe actually make a phone call once in a while. But people aren't imagining EVs yet. And when they, even when they are aware of them, they're thinking of them as golf carts or something deficient from what they're used to. While that puts more responsibility on the rest of us outside the actual automakers themselves, it also creates a lot of opportunity. One of those is to continue on the policy front, because right now, especially outside of China, electrification is very much dependent on external regulation and incentives, in particular CO2 regulations in Europe, uh, fuel economy and the Air Resources Board EV mandate in, in the US, uh, but all of those are a little bit in flux, especially for me at home, where policy is done by Twitter <laughs> and everything changes by the day. Um, so it's important that collectively we keep those sorts of things going and, and relatively stable on balance, if not each individual one, but also that we consider how to continue to lower friction and barriers to entry and make it easier for people and companies to adopt electric transportation in all forms, whether it's passenger cars or something larger. And so that goes to imagining what the next friction points are going to be and trying to solve them in advance because policy does take time. We also need to have a, bring more people to our party. Um, collaboration trumps competition, no pun intended, uh, right now. And there's a lot of effort to try to break up the pie, but we also need to work on making the pie bigger. And one of the things I love what the Netherlands is doing in terms of creating open access as a foregone conclusion and network roaming and not trying to worry about being quite so competitive, but trying to make sure that there's a good user experience in the end. Because if the users aren't happy, then no one is going to be successful with this. But we also need more happy warriors and more cross-pollination of them, especially involving the veterans who actually can keep you from skinning the same knees that we've already skinned and vice versa. So whether that's finding the ones that already exist or encouraging the up-and-comers, or if you already are one, then making your enthusiasm and your knowledge available is really important. Um, although not all happy warriors come across as specifically happy, one of the people that I ended up enjoying the most while we were making Revenge of the Electric Car was a propulsion engineer from General Motors named Frank Weber. And as the name suggests, he's very German, but he was very involved in creating the, the initial Volt. And a couple of years into the filming, they finally had a test mule running around after lots and lots of talking and press releases and not a lot to show for it. So we went to the Milford Proving Grounds, we were driving the car around and we're trying to interview this guy and like, how does it feel to have something people can actually drive? And he's sort of looking at us like, I don't get it. No, how does it feel? You must be excited. And he finally looked at me and goes, I am German. I'm an engineer. I do not feel. 
<laughs> so he was not our happiest warrior, but he was definitely a warrior for the technology. And, and the flip side of that was also that at the time it was very controversial that even while they were letting some media drive this car, no one had driven it outside of electric mode because it has a gas engine also. And it's a big deal, like what's wrong with this car that they're not letting anyone experience it in, in gasoline mode? And I thought, okay, fine, I'm gonna dig out the answer here and I'm trying to chat Frank up and it's obviously not going so well <laughs> for, for obvious reasons. And finally, I'm like, what is wrong with this car that you're just not letting anyone see this? And he goes, well, when the gas engine comes on, I'm like, yeah, you can hear it. <laughs> okay, fine. That was the degree of perfectionism that, that Frank was all about. And so he ended up leaving General Motors and going to BMW and is behind the i3 and several of the other cars that they're working on. And many of his colleagues have now gone on and are running e-mobility at Volkswagen and on, so on and so forth. So, Capturing the happy warriors is important because they don't just stay where they are. We also need to get much better at leveraging the community of drivers and enthusiasts and, and all of those folks. For one thing, there are way more of them than there are of all of us who officially work on this. And they're much, much better at answering a lot of the daily questions and translating sort of geek to English, the stuff we hear all the time, how far, how fast, how much, what's it like to, to work with them, drive them. And they also very much want to. Whenever anyone drives a gasoline or buys a gasoline car or diesel car, they don't feel like they're helping to make that technology successful. Everybody who buys an EV of any brand feels like they're helping to co-create the success of EVs. And that's good. We should embrace that because they are. We need to be a little bit careful, though, in all of this excitement and planning, not to try to force future mobility to behave like past mobility. One of the things I see this happening a lot on right now is the EV charging conversation on infrastructure. And the conversation has evolved over the years from we need more and more and more AC, low charging, slow charging, to speed is better, let's put, you know, anything faster is better, and, and we need to get to kind of the depot model that emulates a petrol station. Thing is, though, that anyone who's ever had the opportunity to charge at home and wake up in the morning with a full car thinks that even five or ten minutes at a gas station is hell. So trying to force people back into that model <laughs> is not necessarily so, so productive. Um, and at the same time, you know, that by that same token, there's, a, there's limited exception of road trips and people who live in apartments and things that just can't necessarily charge at home. But for the most part, Capti charging an EV should not be a captive audience activity any more than we do when we charge our phone. We don't think of charging our cell phone in minutes or hours. We think of the three seconds it takes to plug in and walk away and do something else. So that's the way that we should be thinking about this model too and understanding what people are used to but not trying to keep them into that same model just because it's what we're used to. I always love these sorts of pictures because they imagine like, we'll be in flying cars, but we'll still be wearing poodle skirts and high heels when we're winning them. <laughs> it imagines we change one thing instead of all the other things that will go along with it. And, and that's the balance here. We wanna plan a few steps ahead. I love that, that this center is all about experimenting with types of charging and, and bi-directional charging and smart charging and even getting into blockchain, but it's not trying to decide today how those things will be implemented with 20 years in, in the future in mind. Because as much as we would not have imagined that the smartphone would have changed our personal and professional lives, it remains too soon to say for sure all the ways in which electrification will. We know that EVs and the related technologies have the power to transform the composition of our cities and the composition of our daily lives, but we need to be a little bit careful that we're not looking at a Walkman and forgetting to imagine the iPhone. I love to end on this, on this uh, thought because we are building a revolution. And in hindsight, our second movie probably should not have been titled Revenge. It was a little bit premature. So maybe that one should have been Return. But we will get away with it if we all continue to keep at it and work together. Thank you for letting me join you.